Justice Matters is a co-production of the Minnesota Supreme Court and TPT's Minnesota Channel. My first day on the job was terrifying. You're very much alone in this job. The American judicial system has been a major contributor to the success of our nation and I think the Minnesota judicial system has been and continues to be a major contributor to the success of Minnesota. The Minnesota Supreme Court is the court of last resort for cases that are filed in the state court system. But in any given case, there is always going to be some gray area. If you don't have some butterflies in your stomach when you get up in front of a court, and particularly a state Supreme Court, there's something wrong with you. You shouldn't be there. When you start a job like this, you are first of all struck by uh, the importance of what you're being called to do and the history, the sense of history that you're becoming a part of in the sense that you are sitting in a chair that's been sat in by a number of people before you. So the, the responsibility of it really descends on you quickly. And I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say I had doubts about whether I could do it. Seven justices sit on the Minnesota Supreme Court and each year they hand down somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 140 full opinions in, in, in different cases. There really is two pillars to our society, the jury box and the ballot box. Okay? And in each situation, the citizen plays the pivotal role. And what's important from my standpoint uh, for uh, appellate courts and Supreme Courts to understand is that this really is the one branch of government where an individual citizen can have his or her day. It's, it's a very special moment when you can get up here and, and look at the justices in the eye and, and they rule in your favor and you go, yeah. It is absolutely true that in this state and in most states, we are a government of law and not of human beings, but it's still human beings who apply the law. Laws are only as good as they are generally respected and appreciated by the public to assure people that there is impartiality and fairness and a depth of review. All of the American judicial systems have created this appellate process where you get in Minnesota not only a second opinion at the Court of Appeals, where you have three judges looking at what one judge did but on those cases that warrant further review, somebody has to decide it, and the last step in that process is the Supreme Court. The first day on the bench, everything was fine because I realized I'm on the bench with my colleagues. It's the first day of oral argument in September of 2002. We've got a case, and the lawyers are arguing, and questions are going back and forth between the lawyers and the judges, and I realized this is where I'm supposed to be. There is drama in these cases, there's no doubt about it. There's human drama of a family that is never going to be the same and a child who's lost his parents forever because of violence. Uh, these are real things that happen. It was a murder case and it was a as all murder cases are, uh, a fairly shocking case. This was a murder case involving a guy who murdered his girlfriend's mother. From time to time, questions arise about whether or not, for example, a criminal defendant has been read as Miranda rights, whether or not that criminal defendant has asked for a lawyer, and whether interrogation has continued appropriately. In the Scales case, what the defendant claimed was that the Miranda rights had not been read, and he also claimed that the uh, police statement about what he had said was not correct and uh, you know that that's disputed the police disagree with that obviously the prosecutor disagreed with that um, but that was the claim in the case at the time the scales case came up there had been two Minnesota Supreme Court cases in which the court had handed down opinions and in fairly strong language said we have the technology to record these interviews 
And it makes sense to do that because if the interviews are recorded, we don't have to ask these questions. We don't have to rely on the testimony from the interrogating officers and the testimony of the defendant, which are going to be in conflict. We can look at the tape, trial judges can look at the tape, and we'll know what happened. There was no requirement that the interrogations would be recorded. So what would happen is that a suspect would be interrogated by the police, and then the police would you know, write up a report, and then they would testify in court about what had happened. There were all kinds of motions from the defense claiming all kinds of things, whether they were true or not, but they were claiming things about police brutality or claiming things about what the defendant really said, and there was no actual audio or video recording of what had happened. In scales, the court came to the conclusion that it was no longer time for suggestion. It was time to issue an opinion that said this must happen. The court upheld the conviction. The guy stayed in jail. Uh, but what the court said is from now on, uh, when you have in custody interrogations, when suspects are asked questions by the police, they have to be recorded either by audio tape or by video. Law enforcement initially, I think, was very concerned about the results. This really shook the world of prosecutors and police uh, because uh, in, when you looked around the country at the time, there was only one other state, Alaska, that had a requirement like this, and they were very concerned. Suspects wouldn't talk. Uh, people would be afraid. There'd be cameras. You know, I was contacted by your attorney, and he said that uh, you wanted to come forward and then you wanted to discuss the death of your wife. I think the Scales case is important because it tells us something about the relationship between the Minnesota Supreme Court and the justice system in Minnesota generally. There were a number of different reasons the court could have pointed to for making the decision that it did in Scales. They found the power to make the decision they did in their inherent authority to supervise the justice system in Minnesota. That is a power that the Supreme Court wields and is meant to wield so that the administration of justice can be improved in the state. Then I'm going to read you your rights per Miranda, okay? Improving the administration of justice isn't necessarily something that's pro-defendant uh, or pro-law enforcement. The Constitution requires, I inform you, that Number one, you have the right to remain silent. Number two, anything you say you can and will be used against you in court. Today, most people, including law enforcement, would agree that this case and the court's decision in this case have solved all sorts of problems that was time to solve. Do you understand all those rights? Yes. What's been interesting now as we are many, many years out from that decision is that there's general agreement uh, that this has gone all right. And in fact, there's a lot of cops and prosecutors who believe, including myself, uh, that this has been a good thing. And are you willing to talk to me now about yes. what's happened to your wife? Yes. In Minnesota, we have a very professional police force. And when juries are able to watch these uh, suspects being questioned, they're able to say, you know, this cop is being polite. He's not beating anyone up. Where's that at? It's on Lake Calhoun. On Lake Calhoun? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes they see a suspect a few hours after a crime occurs, and they look very different than they might look that day in the courtroom. 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Were you there by yourself or were your daughter? I was, I was taking my daughter with me, of course. One of the great things of this is that we don't get any motions about whether there was police brutality or what happened. Everyone can see the same videotape. And while you're at church, your, your wife is still in the bathroom? Yeah, she was, she was there. And there's no motions filed, oh, my rights were never read, when you have to have it right there on tape. The jury is able to see that firsthand in kind of the cold-blooded, calculated way in which some of these criminals are thinking when they commit the crime. Is that where this, where this incident took place, was in that apartment? Yes. It's also great for training. Uh, police officers are able to watch interrogations and the good and the bad. Our prosecutors are able to watch what happened in the interrogation room. You light the candle at church and you're there for 15 minutes. What happens next? And it's also, remember, happening at a time uh, where there's just more distrust of institutions, distrust of the police, distrust of people in power, and for the jury's table to see firsthand has been very helpful for getting convictions. Police and prosecutors want to protect the innocent 
but they also want to convict the guilty. And anything that helps toward convicting the guilty is a good thing. And, and uh, one of the things that we like about this is that it, sometimes we've actually been able to catch suspects doing things that they think they're not on tape because the Supreme Court decision didn't require that the camera be right out in the open. We had one guy many years ago who claimed that he was blind and so he couldn't have committed the crime. And this was a murder case. They went back to the date when I was legally blind. And the minute the officer left the room, the guy took a piece of paper out of his pocket and started reading it right on the, right on the camera. We had another case where a guy was involved in a gang murder and they didn't have much evidence and he claimed that he hadn't done it. And, uh, then the cop leaves a room. And you see the guy look down at his shoes and swear, there's blood on my shoes, just like that. And they did a DNA test on the blood and it was the victim's blood and it solved the case. We've been, we've been investigating this for the last, oh, it looks like more 12 hours now. And, uh, We'll pretty much have it all pieced together. We've had other cases where maybe someone confessed to a crime, but the question was, what was the degree of guilt? You know, the question I have is for you, I guess, is whether it was kind of the spur of the moment thing or something that was premeditated. Was it first degree? Was it second degree? Was it less? The jury was able to look at that guy's face. Ready. We have found the body. This guy's now claiming that he suddenly did this crime, but when we look at his face and how he's talking, it didn't seem like that to us. We looked at the area, the woods, whatever, and then came back, and then I grabbed the body. This has been an ongoing discussion in the criminal justice community across the country. Since that time, people have looked at our examples from Minnesota, police from Minnesota, and prosecutors have talked to other police officers about this, and we've said, you know, we think this is working. There's a lot of objection in other states, places like Illinois, New York, over this requirement. You know, they claim that it would show that you didn't trust the police. Well, I think our police, uh, maybe they just haven't been uh, in as much trouble in class cases, but they have they have accepted this and they said, you know what, it helps enhance our credibility because it shows we're doing a professional job. In other places, they've argued about the cost, and as I said, you balance that against against a thirty million dollar wrongful conviction verdict in Illinois, like they had. You know, I take the price of these videotapes and some cameras any day. Seven years later, in two thousand and one, Scales came in front of the court again and petitioned the court for relief saying my interrogation was never recorded and that's a requirement in Minnesota law. And the court said well it's a requirement in Minnesota law now but we decided this case once already. You're staying put Mr. Scales. I think a lot of people uh, imagine that we make law we all sit around here deciding what would be a good law and then we declare that to be the law and, it, and it's quite different. We don't decide a case unless there is a genuine human dispute that has worked its way up through the courts and has come to us. We uh, decide cases one case at a time, one human experience at a time. Being on the Minnesota Supreme Court, I think, is uh, a little bit of an ivory tower in the sense that um, you're removed from the day-to-day hustle-bustle of a law practice. And, and you're really isolated with your books because most of what we do is read and then write. I've never been a writer. I've never written a novel or a piece of nonfiction. But I can imagine that their work habits might be very similar to ours. Uh, you write something, you put it away, you take another look at it with a, hopefully your mind is fresh and you see things that you didn't see before. Our opinions go through multiple drafts even before they're circulated to the other justices. My own practice, I would say, would be probably 10 drafts before I'm satisfied with it, knowing that it's going to come back with suggestions and I'm going to change it some more. Justices on the Supreme Court have to be extremely good writers because the opinions that they write end up being used by trial judges, end up being used by lawyers across the state. 
The difference between being a trial lawyer and being on the Minnesota Supreme Court is it's like the difference between reading a textbook and writing the textbook. On this court, we write the law. And as a lawyer, you read the law and try to use it to your client's advantage. And I don't mean to suggest that one is um, harder or better than the other, but it's, it's, a, it's just a completely different um, skill set. I had argued a lot of cases in, uh, before this court, probably 40 cases in my career. So I was quite familiar with the environment. The transition for me was going from a trial lawyer to a judge when it gets to the point where you're hearing an oral argument and you're asking questions. And so I found that I would ask a lot of lawyers questions that ended with, isn't that true? <laughs> they weren't really very open-ended, helpful questions that would allow a lawyer to expound on a point. They were uh, more like cross-examination, which had been part of my training. So I had to learn how to ask questions. The Supreme Court justices, all seven of them, are there asking questions, and they can ask any question they want that they think will give them information that's helpful. So that can be a very stressful experience for an advocate. You might think you're just going to stand up and give a speech. Well, that doesn't happen. Um, many times you, you have about five words out of your mouth, and sometimes less, and all of a sudden they're peppering you with questions. Uh, the Minnesota court, uh, as at least as currently constituted is, is what is called a hot court and that in appellate language means very active, asks a lot of questions. I've seen Supreme Court arguments uh, where lawyers stood up and uh, in fact before they had even opened their mouths. To ask a question you have to push your microphone button and when I sit on the bench on one end I look down the row and I see fingers to the microphone button you have to be very strategic about how you're going to get your question in. There isn't any order of seniority for asking questions. It's a tremendous uh, intellectual uh, exercise and challenge. Um, and, it's, and it's a search. I mean, the, the courts are probing. You know, what is the extent uh, of uh, the principle that you're asking them uh, to enunciate in this particular case? How far should it go? What about if the facts were this? How does that change it? It's the predictability of the law that this society needs. You know, we have the greatest economic system in the world. It's not by accident. A great deal of it has to do with the judicial system we have in this country because people who conduct their affairs can look to the law and know what the law is. Anyone who's a sports fan knows that when you're watching a game on television, uh, the referees are following a rule book. And who wrote the rule book is, is important because the rules need to be fair, they need to be understandable, and they need to be applied uniformly. And so we write the rule book, if you will, for the state of Minnesota. The Minnesota Supreme Court has handled some cases that have drawn attention nationally and had an impact even internationally. This is probably the most significant case that's ever come out of Minnesota because of its profound impact across the world. One of the documents we found in this case was a 1952 document which is called the Trip Report where people from BAT, the British American Tobacco, uh, came over to the United States and they visited Yale, Harvard, the Mayo Clinic, Stanford. They talked to all the uh, tobacco industry people. And there was a consensus, not just among the health people, but people at the companies who said cigarettes cause cancer. The 1952. They suppressed all that information. You saw the worst of the legal profession. Uh, in my judgment, because this whole system was concocted by lawyers. Back in the early 50s, when the industry met at the Plaza Hotel in New York, the first article had come out in Reader's Digest where uh, doctors had painted the back of, of mice with a tar and cancers had developed. Now, a responsible industry would meet and say, gee, is this accurate? I mean, uh, should we do some scientific research and find out exactly uh, what's going on here? That's what you would expect a responsible industry to do. Instead, the industry got together and said, how do we conceal what it is we already knew? The tobacco case is a good example 
of the kind of case that comes in front of the court all the time. It involved a point about the propriety of reviewing a trial judge's decision concerning some orders about discovery in a case. Can these documents be used in the litigation or not? But it had an enormous impact on the conduct of tobacco litigation across the country. It seemed like a long shot case. Is it really going to be possible to litigate this case in a way that has an impact on what's happening with tobacco reform? And at the time the case was filed, I think people would have said, uh, the smart money is on no. A lot of people said we were crazy. A lot of my partners said I was crazy. Some partners left the law firm. They said, you're going to bankrupt the law firm. Um, so yes, there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, when the suit was filed in 1994, uh, the Minneapolis Tribune did an editorial that said that this is the best of all possible worlds because the state isn't spending any money whatsoever. Uh, and uh, if these folks basically are crazy enough to go ahead on, on this cause of action, God bless them. So yes, there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, as I said earlier, nobody had ever beat the tobacco industry, ever. It involved the leading preventable cause of death in the United States. It involved the largest corporate conspiracy in all of history. It was the largest case in state history in terms of the resources that were put into it. Uh, for example, we estimate that the tobacco companies used as many as 600 lawyers from 60 different law firms. One of the companies told the judge at one point that they were spending a million dollars a week on this case, and the case ran for 140 weeks. The real theory of the case was that they were selling a legal product illegally. What they were doing is they were targeting youth and they were manipulating the nicotine in the cigarettes, uh, all of which was unknown to the public at large. But to go forward with a legal case, you have to have more than a theory and speculation. You have to have a good faith basis in evidence. It was in 1994 as a combination of some congressional hearings, some whistleblowers, evidence that leaked out, that we finally had the evidence to go forward with the case. When a case gets to a state Supreme Court, it usually turns on very specific issues of law and legal principles. And when you describe those issues in and of themselves, they can sound legalistic, even boring, and yet they can have vast implications for ordinary people. That was the case in the tobacco litigation. The centerpiece of this litigation was a two-year quest for us to get into the document vaults of the tobacco industry to see the documents that we knew were there but no one had seen before. And that quest involved fierce, intensive litigation, fighting inch by inch, and multiple appeals to this court and ultimately to the Supreme Court of the United States. Well, the job description essentially was to resolve questions of privilege. There were documents that had been identified as part of the discovery process conducted by plaintiffs. I looked him in the eye and I said, I want you to know this. We are going after your privileged documents like a bee to honey. We're coming. So they knew from day one that we felt, and we did feel, that they were hiding non-privileged documents. Several tobacco companies had claimed attorney-client privilege or work product privilege meaning that you don't get to see this. The judge had the tobacco companies establish a document warehouse over in northeast Minneapolis, and literally, they would have the documents pull up by the semi-load. The volume of documents produced in this case was beyond anything anybody had seen before. Their argument was that they could withhold those documents unless the court ordered a mini-trial on each of these documents. They had so many, hundreds of thousands of documents, that uh, it would have taken years for a judge or even a few judges to go through each and every single document. It was pretty clear that Judge Fitzpatrick wasn't going to sit down and go through 150,000 documents. And as a matter of fact, I didn't go through 150,000 documents. Uh, but he needed somebody to, to get on top of that issue and to make recommendations to him. Uh, so that he could resolve these privilege claims. Mr. Guillen's role was to supervise a streamlined process under the authority of the court to cut through that kind of um, 
delaying tactic. So as part of his order, he directed the lawyers to uh, create classifications or categories. We proposed the categories. They proposed nothing. Uh, the judge, to my recollection, modified some of the categories, appointed a special master, Mark Guillen. Uh, then to put these documents into those categories, and then a random number generator was used by Fitzpatrick's clerk to identify a random sampling of each category. That was the massive process that he oversaw that was approved by the Supreme Court. I was like a blind man feeling a camel and trying to trying to see what the camel looks like. A lot of what I saw was legal advice. Uh, a lot of what I saw was what lawyers do. The most telling examples of the kinds of documents where I said, this category should lose its privilege because, were documents where the lawyers were directing research. The lawyers were saying, well, don't do that kind of research. We don't, we don't think we're going to like what's going to come out of that kind of research. Uh, I recommend to Judge Fitzpatrick that uh, he should not allow the claim of privilege with respect to some of these categories. And that's what went up through our appellate system. And the Supreme Court here looked at it and said, looking at the relative merits of both sides, this was an appropriate way to proceed. They, they paint such a clear, striking picture with tremendous clarity. At the board meeting of Philip Morris, for example, uh, there were discussions from psychologists uh, talking about how children 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 start smoking. The documents showed that the tobacco companies knew for years before the first Surgeon General's report that cigarettes caused lung cancer. We got the documents, I remember, on about a Wednesday, uh, 230,000. We went through them between that Wednesday and the following Monday, and we started using them on that Monday. The case settled within uh, two weeks. Uh, the documents were devastating. The discovery decision in the tobacco case really just related to that little piece in the process of the litigation, but it was a little piece that it turned out to have enormous impact. In the end, um, the case was settled. Because of what the courts did here, the Supreme Court of Minnesota, uh, the appellate court, and, and Judge Fitzpatrick, quite frankly, uh, had a absolutely uh, profound impact, not just nationally, but internationally. The information in those documents is continuing to reverberate around the world. Um, the impact is really hard to exaggerate. Surgeon General Coop, who, by the way, is a Republican, uh, said that the Minnesota case was one of the most significant public health developments of the second half of the 20th century. I've had the um, experience, the very gratifying experience, of having health officials from as far away as Sri Lanka and Uzbekistan come up to me and say, thank you so much. If you were, were part of getting those documents out in the Minnesota lawsuit, we're using those in our country and they're making a difference. In Europe uh, in particular, where people thought that tobacco reform would be generations coming, in part because of the work that was done here, uh, that reform is happening right now. I was recently uh, privileged to visit Ireland and there's no smoking in Ireland. There's, the pubs of Ireland have been smoke free for more than two years. Norway is smoke-free, Uruguay is smoke-free, Italy is smoke-free, and they're even talking about it in France. And of course, the economic impact in Minnesota has been substantial. It's been over $2 billion, I believe, as of this date, that has come to the state, and the state will continue in perpetuity, as long as these cigarette companies are in business, to get somewhere between $175 million to $200 million a year that goes into the general fund. At the time this case settled, one out of every two billboards in Minnesota was devoted to tobacco advertising. So kids every day on their way to school were seeing cigarette billboards. This case put an end to that. We no longer have a single um, cigarette billboard in Minnesota. One out of every three teenagers owned a t-shirt or a hat or a backpack or some other free gear with the brand name of a cigarette brand on it. And the research showed that owning those kinds of things was one of the strongest predictors that those kids would take up smoking. We put an end to that. That no longer exists. It ended the image of the tobacco companies as untouchable in the courts. There were a lot of other things that were happening around the country that contributed to that. But the idea that tobacco reform was a possibility came in part 
from the success in that litigation. The cases are far more complicated, it seems to me now. When you're young, everything seems simple, so it may just be the difference in me, but I think there's a difference in complexity. Our legislation passed by our legislature it used to be in one volume when I was a law clerk, now it's in ten volumes. People have become more litigious in our society. They want the court to decide more questions that maybe years ago they would simply walk away from or try to resolve themselves. Judges never make decisions in a vacuum. We depend on a lot of people. We depend on our law clerks for research. We depend on each other for um, a collegial discussion of issues and you really need to be a person to be a good judge who can listen and, and depend on the advice and counsel of other people. People ask me often, what do you like best about your job? And I always say, working with six other very qualified people who uh, each bring different experiences and perspectives. And I find that when we talk about a case, they enrich my view so much more than what I brought into it. I always come out of conference understanding the case at a level much deeper than I came in. But when people ask me, what do you like least about the job? I say, working with six other people who don't always agree with my point of view. Judges every day make very important decisions. There is always one side that is unhappy. There are very few jobs like that, where every decision you make pleases one party but not the other. Sometimes you read the appellant's brief you're totally convinced by the arguments. Then you read the respondent's brief. You're totally convinced by the arguments. You go to the reply brief. You understand you have a problem. <laughs> they tend to often be cases that are, in your mind, 51%, 49%. Neither side is 100% correct. We are a branch of government that's well regarded. We aren't perfect. And there are things we can do better. And we are working on those things. Um, the public perception of us is um, weakest among uh, communities of color and groups of women. That there is a perception that not just in the justice system, but in, in the criminal, not just in the courts, but the criminal justice system generally, that communities of color um, still struggle to find legitimacy. I don't know whether we in the justice system in fact treat communities of color less fairly, but the fact that they believe that they are treated less fairly is enough. Whether it's a reality or whether it's a perception, it's still a problem that it's important we address. The Supreme Court's function is, is simple. We want to make sure that everybody's playing by the same rules. We want to be sure that when you go into court in Ottertail County, Minnesota, that you're going to get the same brand of justice that a person gets when they go into a courtroom in Hennepin County. Justice Rosalie Wall was the first woman appointed to the court. Really up until that time, it had been exclusively male. Minnesota really made a historical mark in the 80s when we had a majority of women on the court who were female. We had a seven-member court. Four of, of the court members were female. We were the first state, really, to, to pass that milestone. We just had our first Chief Justice, who was a woman, Kathleen Blatz, she recently retired from the court. Some people use the term activist judge because they don't like the result. They disagree with the result. Activist judge is a term that we hear a lot about in the media. And um, the joke among judges is, well, you get called an activist judge when you rule against someone. So it's usually the losing party that, that says, oh, she must be an activist judge. We want a dead judge? I believe a lot of people think that Supreme Court judges come to the bench with an agenda that's political in nature. In my experience, that has not been true in Minnesota. I want somebody who uh, is going to listen, to look at precedent, uh, to say, is that precedent still relevant in light of changing times? The justices that sit on the Minnesota Supreme Court are interested in interpreting the law, and explaining the law.
but most of their work doesn't involve issues that would lend themselves to any kind of charge of judicial activism. It's a matter of looking at an existing state statute and saying, in this case, this is how it should be applied. I defy you to predict, based on what you perceive this judge's political philosophy to be, to say that's what he or she's going to do in the future. I mean, how can we possibly expect somebody not to look at what the facts are on the case before her and say, how do those facts fit within established precedent? Have things changed so much that we need to modify that precedent? Do, do you we want to just stay the way you are? I mean, I, I guess some people would say, yes, you go back to the legislature uh, to change it, but that's not the way, we, we, that's not the checks and balances of our system. What if the legislature does nothing? Where would we be with um, uh, discrimination in this nation if the courts hadn't stepped in? And I just watched the other night, Separate But Equal, it's a, a movie that Sidney Poitier was in uh, back in the early 90s. Where would we be if the Supreme Court had not made the decision that Separate But Equal does not give an individual child the right to achieve her full measure? Where would we be? And of course, the constitutional principles continue to evolve in their application to new emerging societal situations. You have a court that is writing, understanding that whatever it writes is going to be used in a variety of different contexts, in cases that are unimaginable for a period of time unforeseen in the future. The best aspect of my job is that I have the opportunity to serve a justice system that I really believe in. We have the best system there is, and to be serving in it is a huge honor. There isn't a day I, I come to work that I don't feel that way. Probably was about 1983, I was asked to go out to West Central Minnesota uh, at that time, I was the president of the Jewish Community Relations Council on Anti-Defamation League. And there was an organization from Dakota called the Posse Comitatus that preached a philosophy of hate, and that was its best quality. And uh, so I was asked to go and uh, see if I could cool things down in the uh, rural community out there. Uh, because I also knew many of those farmers from the work that I had done representing dairy co-ops. And so I s agreed to do that, and they asked one other person to go and work with me on it, and he turned out to be Paul Wellstone. He was a wrestler, and my son uh, was a wrestler, is a wrestler. And he was about to go into uh, join the Northwestern wrestling team, my son was. And Paul always used to tell me, don't forget that farmer's carry, that farmer's carry. And so I called my son up and said, you have advice directly from a senator of the United States of America. You're supposed to do the fireman's carry. I thought uh, that's the kind of fellow I wouldn't mind having in a dark alley as long as he was on my side. And I had you, and we won this race. I remember the day because we swore in new lawyers that morning. I, got in my car to drive back over to the court, and this story came over the news. Well, we got a call here from uh, New York City, from a national media affiliate, and they'd like to know, how do you replace a senator in Minnesota? I said, call him back and ask him why he's asking the question. I was representing Paul that day in federal court in Minneapolis, uh, a certain individual whose name is Oli Savior, had brought a lawsuit against Paul and others having to do, I did not think, much merit, but it had to be defended. And so I made a motion to dismiss the case in the federal court, and it, the motion was heard the morning of October 25 of 2002. It comes back into my, into my office and it says, well, the local affiliate, KSTP, has reported that Wellstone's plane crashed and that Senator Wellstone was killed in that plane. So I uh, drove back to my office here in St. Paul and did not turn the radio on, as it were, and I got in my office and my entire staff was crying. What's going on? You know, Senator Wellstone's plane is missing and presumed to be downed. 
we called up uh, to, to the airport and, and in fact confirmed that uh, the senator's plane had gone down and that his wife uh, and, he, and his, he and his wife and his daughter and three aides uh, were killed. It does come to the Supreme Court when there's a, where there is an election dispute, it comes to us. So I remember driving back to the court, I, calling my assistant and saying, you know, is everybody gathering? And we were in anticipation of the case coming to us. The plane went down on a Friday. By the next week, there was a question about how ballots for the election on the 5th of November should be handled how should absentee ballots be handled? And it was a question that had to be answered immediately. It would have been nice to have uh, time for some emotion at the time, but there really wasn't the time because it was only, what, 10, 11 days before the election. Questions like, if someone has already voted absentee ballot, can, can they vote again? Uh, which one will be counted? Uh, will, will absentee ballots that have been cast, will they be counted? How do you replace a candidate? The timeline was so short. We typically have long timelines here. We usually have uh, uh, written briefs weeks ahead of oral argument. We have uh, our staff and ourselves study them have our questions formulated, then come to argument, and then have a long time to write a decision. Which is good. You want as much time as you need to decide a case. And the Wellstone case was really unique because it required some very short briefing. We had to get arguments scheduled very quickly, and then we had to decide the case as, as quickly as we could and still make a good decision. You had a national political struggle going on at that point, and you had control of the Senate uh, hang, potentially hanging in the balance. I went up to the state office building and uh, met with uh, representatives of the Secretary of State's office. I have all my assistants and our lawyers in my, in my office, and Alan Weinblatt walks in and he, and he says to me, with tears in his eyes, he says, Alberto, you're not going to steal this election from us. I determined that the Secretary of State would, again, at best, take the easiest way, and at worst, a partisan way. David Lillyhog walks in, who is the attorney, personal attorney for, for uh, the senator. And, and Lillyhog walks in, and Alan walks in, and, says, and he, I could see the grief in his eyes. He could hardly talk. It was just hours after it, and they had not really begun to think about it. So then the three of us started crying, and my staff got up and slowly all filed out, and they closed the door. And we just stood there, and we wiped our eyes, and we looked at each other. And I said to Ellen, what do you need? What do you need? Right now, what do you need? He says, well, I need law books. I, I, I need I need." A when computer, I, I, I need to be able to respond this to, for my clients. There was no stonewalling by my adversaries. They recognized that it was important that the citizens of Minnesota learn what the new rule was going to be. It was an incredible state of confusion. We had partisan divides. They had partisan interest on both sides. We began to address the legal issues. And the first step that we took was we began to put together for the secretary talking points that she would issue that evening. There was a proposed supplemental ballot uh, set forth in a two uh, news releases issued by the Secretary of State's office. The nomination from the party uh, had to be in our hands by the 31st. So the party had to look at its bylaws and figure out how to, to do that nomination. We, in turn, then had to prepare and instruct all the county officials about how to go about substituting a name on the ballot. By Monday, I had had a call from uh, my youngest offspring. Dad, how am I going to get to uh, vote for somebody? I voted for Paul.
He was away at college. And the thought struck me. He's certainly not the only one away at college or out of the country or out of the city or away on business. If you're ill, you're going to be out of the country, if you're going to be in some way, shape, or form not in, in your polling place and you cannot go to the polling place, then the, our, our state basically says you can send in a, an absentee ballot. I saw that almost 5% of the population of Minnesota had voted by absentee ballot in the year 2000. A lot of people had voted in an absentee fashion for, for the senator. And the question was, what happens to my ballot? Does it, does it count? What happens to my vote? Is, is my vote, can I cast for, for the senator? And the unfortunate answer was no. It was not important who these folks had voted for. But was it, what was important is would they have an opportunity to cast a fair and full ballot based upon who the candidates were going to be. Those ballots were intended to vote for the DFL candidate and therefore should they be transferred to the current DFL candidate. And, and fortunately the answer was no. The petition was drafted on Monday the 28th. So that would be eight days before the election. I did have one goal, one and a half. Uh, one was to make the uh, re-voting by absentee ballots as open and easily used by the greatest number of people as possible. The second goal was to make that supplemental ballot and the instructions as clear and in plain English as I could persuade the court. The voting, of course, was to occur the next Tuesday. And so the entire matter had to be compressed so that we could get written arguments, hear oral arguments, render a decision, issue an order in time for the Secretary of State and the county auditors to do what they had to do for the election ju just within the matter of a few days. The Supreme Court, as I expected, moved with, as they say, all deliberate speed uh, to hear the matter. Uh, members of the court are very much aware uh, that it is the elections belong to the people, not to election officials. Election law is very complex. You, you can have different interpretations based on how, which side of the table you're sitting on. And that's why we have the courts. The justices were very attentive. They were sitting on the edge of their chair. They recognized that, that we were crossing that line where it's not just an abstract law that we're considering. Everything we say and do will be part of the record. Less than a week before the election, the court heard the case and issued an order decision immediately. In the course of the oral argument, I asked the Supreme Court to order the Secretary of State and the county election officials to send new absentee ballots, together with supplemental ballots, to absolutely everyone who had applied for an absentee ballot. People who had voted for uh, Senator Wellstone would then now have a fresh start with an opportunity to vote for whomever the DFL determined would be its nominee. And those who had voted for uh, uh, then Mayor Coleman uh, could either let their initial ballot stand or do a new and different vote if they wanted to change their vote. The court disagreed. The Supreme Court fundamentally did not change our processes and procedures. The laundry list that had been presented in the lawsuit did not prevail. It was basically questions of what if or wouldn't it be better. I had a plan B, which again I thought was not unreasonable, in fact it was reasonable, and that is to simply order the Secretary of State to send new and replacement ballots to anyone who asked for one. 
but I also ask that it be sent by a variety of methods, not just United States mail, but also by internet posting, by facsimile, by courier, and by any other means of modern communication. There's just a lot of dangers and issues in, in that absentee ballot process. Questions of are people voting twice, for example, people committing fraud. Is there someone sending in uh, 10 absentee ballots? That suggested plan B didn't fare much better. Uh, but the third avenue of relief, which is the one I thought most likely to, uh, to be granted, and I wanted to ensure it would be granted, was in fact. And that is anyone who asked for a uh, replacement uh, absentee ballot and supplemental ballot would have to be sent one. The Secretary of State's position had been, sorry, it's too late. The Attorney General's position was, hey, there's a statute which says only one, can, one set can be sent by mail. They've had their one bite at the apple and too bad. So I disagreed with both the Secretary and the Attorney General. I was kind of vocal in that disagreement. I requested a very specific order from the court stopping the Secretary from sending out the old ballots, that is, the ones with Paul Wellstone's name on it. And so I asked that that specific order be granted, and it was. The lawsuit was about procedure. It wasn't about ideas or concepts or larger issues. It was about how do we do elections in Minnesota. We have the facility to move quickly when we have to move quickly. Uh, we owe that to the public, I think, to do it. In the moment, they were able to answer the question that had to be answered and answer it in a way that allowed that election to go forward. What I remember about the Wellstone case was, was um, how proud I was of this institution because we, and how much the world was really looking to us to restore a sense of confidence and restore a sense of order uh, at a time when there was a, very much a sense that we had lost our way. I was very proud of how the court brought a decision together, gave it to the public, and really, I think, restored a sense of, okay, we can go forward. It might sound like too personal of an answer, but I still am mourning my friend's death. When I see the lack of civility in public life, conflict in public life for conflict's sake, not to advance an issue or a position, I mourn all over again. I mourned last Thursday, a week ago, my eldest grandson uh, is 12 years old and he began his wrestling at the junior high school level. And, and I thought about uh, Paul again. When I go teach a class, when I uh, talk about the judiciary, uh, when I think of how other parts of the world would treat the situation that arose uh, from the crash. I mourn again, but find joy in our system. Uh, in, in Rwanda, a civil war resulting in the death of, I can't say millions, but hundreds of thousands occurred because the plane of the president of Rwanda went down. We don't have that in great part because of the judiciary. The men and women of our uh, judiciary, no matter how partisan when they were lawyers, in my opinion, take off those partisan clothes when they put their judicial robes on. Jurisprudence is, I would say, both an art and a science. It is not a science. I think jurisprudence is very much a science. Partly a science and partly an art. It is only an art 
of the possible. Both an art and a science. I don't mean to evade your answer. I guess as lawyers, you know, the first thing we learn uh, in law school is that the answer to every question is, it depends. It's both. Here's the part that's science. The law is there, we can read it, and we can see what courts in the past have done. The rule of law passes from one judge to the next, and we can count on the rule of law being consistent. But it does not give firm, fixed answers to every question. The art of it is taking new facts, things that may come up, and applying the law to those facts. The law has to evolve. It has to reflect uh, who it is we are today. Having a sense for the long-range implications for what you're doing. You know, the art of jurisprudence, where you can really get a sense of the import of a decision beyond just the case that you're dealing with. It's that art uh, and that science combined that enables judges to do what's right uh, in establishing precedent that people can rely on. And I'm not there in my career, and I hope I get there someday, but I think once you become a very, very good jurist, it, it becomes more art. But I think you start with science. Without the law, as it is in America, we wouldn't be the nation we are. Justice Matters is a co-production of the Minnesota Supreme Court and TPT's Minnesota Channel.